Dzień dobry Państwu. Serdecznie witam na spotkaniu dyskusji. Na konferencji Europejskiej na Crossroads. Co to są socjalne demokratyczne dyrekcje dla przyszłości? Organizowane przez Ferdinand Lassalle Centrum Social Thought i Friedrich Hebert Foundation. Ta konferencja jest częścią długiej, długiej tradycji Lassalle debat, common ventures with the Friedrich Heber Foundation and the uh, uh, Lassalle Foundation are aimed at uh, commemorating our patron, the creator, the founder of the German social democracy, Ferdinand Lassalle, but also by uh, commencing a number of years ago this cycle of international debates. Our intention was to was for Wrocław to become a place of uh, exchanging ideas and discussing the progressive uh, visions and the progressive uh, policies of today. We believe that Wrocław, with its uh, multinational history as well as uh, its location in the heart of Europe, is a perfect place for discussion between social democrats uh, from Central Europe. During the last few years, we uh, have many uh, renowned guests, people from think tanks and political parties. Uh, we also have the uh, deputy chairman of the uh, Social Democratic Party of uh, Germany. Last year, this discussion was dedicated to the history of uh, Polish social democracy and lessons uh, for the future. This year, we decided to invite uh, representatives from Germany, Polish, uh, Hungarian and Czech uh, social democracies in order to discuss the issues which seem to be most important when it comes to uh, European politics. Right now, uh, European social democracy has to face many crises. We have the economic crisis and the uh, immigrant crisis as well, also a uh, crisis regarding the trust of citizens towards institutions, uh, state institutions and democratic institutions. Uh, there's also a menace to uh, European coherence, uh, also related to the Brexit problem. Also problems related to the functioning of the Eurozone and the situation in Greece. Uh, we believe that this year uh, we should focus on these issues. And I'm very glad that this year uh, we have a delegation, a strong delegation of experts uh, from these countries. Yesterday and today in the morning we had some workshops when uh, we had some profound discussions uh, regarding each of these subjects. And right now we wish to discuss along with all of you uh, what's happening in Europe and what European social democracy can propose as an alternative to what is currently happening. I also think that uh, it will be interesting for our Polish uh, audience to get to know the current situation in all these uh, countries, not through the media, but uh, from the people who are involved both intellectually and politically in uh, the public life in these states. Uh, I'd like to thank you for being here. I'd also like to thank uh, our panelists and also the institution, well, without which it would be impossible to have uh, to hold today's meeting to Friedrich Ebert Foundation. I would now like to uh, give the microphone to uh, the chairman of the foundation, Ron Feit, who will officially open our meeting. My Polish is a bit poor, so I continue in English. Now you are surprised that I'm not talking in German. I'm talking in English because I pay a lot of respect and reference to all the colleagues who are coming from different countries, of the region. And we have this council today, as Michal uh, Siska has explained already, together as we did it in English. So Europe is, uh, is, is very close. Europe is our topic, uh, has been also our topic today. Um, I think that uh, uh, it is a good idea to, 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 uh, to do that uh, practically on the birthday of Ferdinand Lazar, who was born on the 11th of April of 1825. And uh, today to do this uh, uh, attached, uh, attached to his birthday, because it was the birth not only of the German, but also of the European the social democracy in 18. 66, and um, Ali was born in, in, in Dresden, also died in, in Dresden. So, 
uh, we were talking today, uh, this, is, uh, this is group of, of uh, uh, leftist, uh, social democratic intellectuals and activists about the, the problems and also the challenges social democracy is facing uh, in each of the countries uh, they belong to, but also we were talking about uh, possible common social democratic positions on the future of the European, uh, the European level, European level. This is exactly how um, the topic of the discussion today. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, very much all the panelists, but maybe also one of them I would like to welcome very much, Senator Judith Pignor. We are very proud and very happy that you are much as you are going to discuss for one of the most famous uh, uh, broadcast uh, uh, citizen. Uh, we are very happy that you are here. Thank you for coming. So I wish you a very, very uh, interesting evening. I uh, hand over to, to Michal Siska, and uh, I hope that uh, after the, the panelists have discussed the topics, you are also uh, starting to interfere and also to do your comments and to your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, I also one technical uh, aspect. There is a uh, attendance list. Uh, we'd be very grateful if you could fill it out. Uh, this will be very helpful. And also, I would like to welcome very much and thank you uh, all our guests for arriving. First of all, Anna Freidank from the uh, Social Democratic Party of Germany, Zoltan Lachner from Hungary, a pathologist, Petra Steiger uh, from Slovakia, a scientist related to the Social Democratic Movement, and Radim Hajduk from the Idealiste CZ Movement, uh, also related to the Czech Social Democracy. And lastly, last uh, not least, Josef Pinero, whom I really do not have to introduce here. And as uh, Ron mentioned, our discussion will be a panel discussion. In the second part, we would also like you to get involved and also have a chance to ask some questions and uh, provide suggestions and commentaries. So our meeting uh, will last up to uh, 8 p.m. And now for the first question to our guest from Hungary. As uh, because of the uh, chairman of the party who is uh, ruling in Warsaw, mentions that we're going to have a Budapest here in Warsaw. Uh, we have Budapest here in Wrocław now, that's Zoltan Lechner, and I would like to ask him the characteristics of the government of uh, Viktor Orban. The rule of Orban in Poland, especially in the eyes of uh, right-wing politicians, uh, is said to have challenged the huge capital that it works in the interests of the, the common citizen. And my question is, is it true? Is it a type of government who is representing uh, the common citizen? and uh, the challenge is the big capital. Also, the second question regarding the strategies of the Hungarian opposition. Is the strategy effective? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you for your invitation and uh, thank you for the audience to come to listen to us. And uh, um, well, uh, uh, it is my privilege to start this conversation being country is such an uh, uh, interesting spot in Europe. And uh, yes, I was asked to give an overview about, uh, about the situation in Hungary and, and the six years of uh, uh, the German regime. It's a long story, of course, and I have just a stage long uh, that I want uh, to read it out, of course, but I will use it. So it's a long story, but uh, maybe the 2010 election could be a start point for us to tell you what's, uh, what, what's had, uh, happened, what has happened in Hungary. Um, in 2010, uh, Fidesz, Victor Orban's party, uh, won a uh, landslide. Election. Uh, uh, they won 2.7 million 
Bones, wie ich vor so einer Record High, in of Bones. But what was more important, I think that, uh, that the former, uh, formerly uh, strong uh, socialist liberal uh, coalition collapsed. And, uh, and uh, in 2006, uh, the socialists won uh, 3 million votes, and liberals another uh, 300,000. But uh, in 2010, uh, liberals fell out of parliament, and uh, the socialists gained only 1 vote. And then in 2014, uh, the situation was almost the same. Socialist, socialist-led uh, uh, opposition alliance gained almost 2.3 million of votes, and the uh, 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 2.2 million of votes. What uh, what meant that uh, uh, in 2010, in 2014. Fidesz won again a two-third majority because uh, in the meantime they changed uh, the election rules in Hungary and of course the government uh, party uh, tailored uh, the new election rules uh, uh, to the and, uh, and yes, after, after the, the first uh, two-third majority in, in 2000, and after 2011, um, one of uh, the first moves of, uh, of the Fidesz government was, was to curb uh, the authority of the constitutional courts and to uh, conquer uh, the state media. Uh, there has been new developments in Hungary and now uh, the government uh, attempted successfully to uh, gain influence uh, in the circle of the uh, commercial uh, Israel. And uh, in 2011, uh, uh, the government, uh, uh, MPs of the government, accepted the new fundamental law, so called fundamental law, instead of uh, the constitution of 1990. And uh, on the basis of this fundamental law, uh, the government uh, uh, changed the whole checks and balances uh, system in Hungary, they changed uh, institutions, and uh, they conquered other uh, institutions uh, and appointed uh, party members and party uh, lines to import and constitutional institutions. So that is one part of the story. Is, uh, so ruining the, the tax and science system in Hungary. Uh, uh, another important uh, development, uh, very uh, well, the very creative use of national authority, uh, the traditional Hungarian uh, national advances as political weapons and uh, and scapegoating mm -hmm. uh, very. Uh, sophisticated uh, uh, sometimes, like not just sometimes, the government usually speaks as if it was uh, in opposition uh, and attacks powers who are the enemies, so called enemies of the Hungarians and uh, the Hungarian. This is a this is a very long list of, uh, of the enemies and the very flexible list that you can uh, found. Uh, on this list, uh, 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 the communists, who are mostly the Hungarian Socialist Party and former ministers of, uh, of the Socialist Party, for Brussels, the Brussels administration, uh, liberal media, uh, human rights activists, who, uh, who are and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the case of refugees, which is actually not of them, or or George, uh, which is another uh, uh, important country, who is supposed to be uh, 
another uh, trend for, for the open system smart um, these, the, these are the frames of the, of the Hungarian uh, situation nowadays. And uh, as maybe you uh, know uh, that in, uh, in 2014, uh, the so called democratic opposition parties is uh, uh, leftist, old leftist, new leftist, and uh, liberal parties join together uh, an alliance, um, which, uh, which uh, could have been uh, a joint role. For campaigners, for containment of Fidesz and, and, and Jody, which is a which is a right joint Axis party in Congress. But uh, to tell the truth, that was a rather uh, uh, rather rather just an episode in the long, long history of the fighting between between the uh, very fragmented uh, uh, democratic side. Uh, uh, Actors of this very democratic side, and almost literally on the, on, the, on the next day of the election, they split and, uh, and choose, uh, choose, uh, uh, choose their own way. And I think it presents the questions for, for uh, these uh, opposition parties who to the next election in 2018. And, uh, and uh, indeed, we can, we, can, uh, we can identify uh, very, very uh, embarrassing questions uh, about the opposition. Uh, for example, what, what uh, would be their political direction? Because it is a, it's a mix of uh, different ideologies, and it is, uh, uh, it is not clear what is the uh, what would be a uh, uh, popular and, uh, and uh, evidence-based uh, uh, politics of, uh, of, of the Hungarian opposition, centrist uh, politics, uh, uh, kind of alliance between these different uh, actors, uh, could be logical, but uh, on the other hand, uh, this, uh, this alliance in 2014 and the future possible alliance also needs uh, uh, a vision about the uh, Hungarian vision about uh, what would happen after Orban and I think this is a very important uh, part of the, of the failure of uh, the opposition, of the weakness of the opposition. Uh, last sentence, um, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, Hungary is silent. Uh, if you, if, you, if you see news uh, about Hungary, uh, you, uh, you can find uh, 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 reports about uh, uh, protest movements uh, uh, on Friday, and then uh, next uh, Tuesday uh, you had uh, two uh, uh, strikes of teachers. And uh, the next week will be a uh, general strike, one day general strike of teachers. Uh, uh, Hungary has happened like that uh, for 21 years. Uh, but these movements uh, 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 don't have a direct channel to the party system, the party system, uh, and, uh, who gain. Uh, 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 direct support for for these movements so they can share that to different stories Thank you very much for this response. Now I would like to ask Radim Haidek, because when we're speaking about Central Europe, when you mention Orban, Mili Semen, President of Czech Republic, is the next person you mentioned. So I would like to ask about this paradox. Semen is coming from a social democratic party. He used to be a leader of this party, and now he's being criticized uh, because of this party. What's the conflict about? Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Here, uh, I'm, all, all, I'm surprised that I understand Polish. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, uh, speaking so 
But uh, the question about Miloševa, as he put, uh, can anyone tell me uh, one sentence or one word about Miloševa, what comes to your mind if you tell, except Katarzyna, she's from the Czech Republic. Does anyone ring a bell this name? Bunga Bunga. Bunga Bunga. And what do you mean by that? It's Bernusconi. Uh, oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting implication, no. but I think <laughs> well, I, I'm kind of confused. Uh, no, no, no. But uh, you can all, all uh, you can always say he's very clever politician and he's very pragmatic politician. Okay, that's I think Viktor Orbán is also he can be also described like this. Uh, maybe to answer a question, not briefly, but maybe a little bit longer. I have to tell you a story about him. Do you know where he started as a politician? It was a liberal party that was free market oriented. So it was the quite opposite of the Social Democratic Party. He was there briefly like one year in the 90s and then he seek for his uh, electorate and his electorate social democratic one. So uh, I think it's an example of his pragmatism. And he applies this pragmatism uh, after he was uh, kind of forced from the Social Democratic Party in 2005 or 6. Uh, well, why did he uh, why did he quit his uh, membership in Social Democratic Party? It was easy. Social Democratic Party didn't support him enough. He wanted to be a president, and he was betrayed in 2003 by the Social Democratic MPs who elected then uh, the president. And he felt his betrayal, and he kept it, he kept it in his uh, body through the times. And in 2013, 14, I don't know, and there was a presidential election. Then he ran for and he won it. And he won it through his little party called uh, uh, Law of People. The party of Law of People. And it was kind of social democratic, but it was mainly conservative. Uh, and it tells, him, tells about him everything. He's a conservative uh, ex leftist, pragmatic, ex free market oriented politician. <laughs> So it's kind of irrational, you know, if I was a common Czech uh, voter, I would say, what the hell, uh, I don't know who he is, and why should I vote for him? But you know, he's a very good rhetor, and he can raise questions that, and answer them uh, that uh, no other Czech politician does. Uh, for instance, migration crisis, it's his strong suit. Uh, now, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, <coughs> there are uh, lots of uh, little parties in the Czech Republic that are kind of fascist. <coughs> uh, there are anti-immigrant a lot, and they are mm, not very kind uh, in the means of uh, communication with other politicians. But they communicate well with us, Miloš Miloš Zeman, who was anti-fascist in the 90s. Uh, and he got, got, he got the, uh, the sympathy <coughs> from the public, because uh, uh, a week ago or so, there was a poll, and uh, they asked Czechs who will solve the migration crisis best. And it was with 52% Miloš Zeman who has no power to solve, constitutionally, no power to solve the, the problem. Uh, so, <coughs> if there is a pattern, Miloš Deman just seeks for the, for the issues that are interesting for the Czech electorate, and they just exploit them. No matter ideology. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if you are right-wing, left-wing, center, liberal, conservative. If, if, it is, uh, 
if it is for his good, he will exploit it. And therefore, I think that's the main reason he left the social democracy. Because even though social democracy in the times of 2006 was very populist, I think, or it was presented like, um, it holds its uh, ideas. And Miloš Zeman didn't get anything from it. Thank you very much. Now we move into Slovakia. Because in Slovakia in the recent months a lot happened. Numerous events that shocked the public in whole Europe happened because for the first time in Parliament, a very open neo-Nazism fascist party uh, went to the Parliament, the party of Marian Kutleba, and in recent time a new government was created that from the point of view of the European Union is a bit exotic. So Petra, my question for you, first of all, where did the success come from? Uh, who voted for it? What do we know about the electorate that voted for <laughs> open Slovakian neo nazist party? And the second question is about the new government. So how did we end up with this composition? What's its political agenda? Thank you very much for the work. Good evening. And um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here tonight. So to answer your question and react to what you said, the government is exotic. <laughs> I think you couldn't have picked that word. But it's exotic in more ways. But before I uh, elaborate on that a little bit, let me offer you my perspective on why Marian Kotleba was successful. And um, following the elections, we had eight parties in the government. Uh, the party of Marian Kotleba uh, has come through with 8%, which is quite a lot uh, for such a small country. So where does this come from? Um, we know that um, the majority of Kotleba's voters are young people, people that came to ballot polls for the first time in their lives. They come from the least developed regions with highest rates of unemployment. Um, contrary to that, we can follow the pattern of the regions with the uh, lowest problem with unemployment and have the lowest support for Kotleba. So you can see the relations, the relationship of the <coughs> and support for right radicals very clearly. So that's, from my point of view, the major factor. Um, that there have been regions with uh, many, many years of permanent unemployment situation unsolved and uh, young people without perspective. Young people that had parents that were brought up by parents who went to work abroad. Uh, young people brought up um, with fathers coming home for weekends. Um, and we all know these stories, so that's one thing. Another aspect which um, I personally consider because um, in my role as social anthropologist I study um, the ways societies and people remember is how we deal with history. I don't think this is the major factor, but it is a factor indeed how we teach and talk about history. Uh, when you ask young people nowadays that the awareness about the fascist Slovak state is very low. And um, this has to do with more facts. It has to do with the fact that there has been the transgenerational trauma um, and things simply not being said. The failure of schools to discuss. And, and why I'm bringing this up, just to give you the background, I, I often forget because um, it is uh, something generally known. Kotleba's party is um, and was in the past um, very vocally um, praising the fascist Slovak state. And they have been very careful not to raise these issues in the campaign, not to speak about it in the public. 
And we all know that um, they question Holocaust and um, their extremely racist rhetoric. So um, I see that the society has, to an extent, to a great extent, underestimated uh, the power of, of, of Kotlova. Kotlova is not here or hasn't been around just for two days. He's been around for a while. Uh, he's been uh, for a year or two, I think, the mayor of Banska uh, Bistrita district, a region with very high unemployment rates. Uh, he's been um, known for a number of scandals having to do with cutting uh, financial means, having uh, family members occupying persons, so on and so on. So, um, and the reaction of the media was either not giving him space at all, better ignoring, or portraying him in a way that for many people made him look as, as a martyr. So the discussion right now is how do we deal with this guy in the government? Do we ignore him? Do we leave when he speaks? Um, as some of you might have um, picked up, when the, the president was uh, starting or initiated uh, the, the, the government negotiations, he, he did not invite Marian Kotlova as one of the parties, a representative of one, of one of the parties that has been elected. Now, you can either interpret this as a clear anti-fascist gesture, which I'm sure it was meant to be, but at the same time, I see the danger of this giving even more support to Kotlaba. Um, or we can see it both ways. Um, so right now, um, we have... Um, I think 14 members of parliament uh, of his party out of 150. I think the best way to defeat uh, right radicalism is through solid socio-economic policy. I think, um, and, and I will now um, answer, try to answer your second question about the newly formed government, uh, which is completely aware of the threat and uh, that's why it is somehow exotic, <coughs> formed as an answer to the threat from the extreme right. So we have uh, SMER, Social Democracy, which won the election with 28%, which was somehow a drop, uh, compared to um, the previous, um, its previous success, which was, I think, over 40%, and it was the only government party in <coughs> the previous years. And uh, its coalition partners are now the Hungarian party, the, the newly formed, the most uh, the nationalist party, and um, SIEG, which is a newly formed party in economic matters, liberal and cultural issues, more conservative. Um, I have today, uh, the new government has published its um, program declaration, which has not been passed through the parliament yet. It's going to be next week. And I have only managed to skim through it briefly, but already in the beginning, um, it's, it defines itself as a coalition government dedicated to continuity, compromise, and progress, trying to um, trying to, trying to uh, connect the deeply divided society in the face of the threat of the right extremism, prepared to use all political and legal means, and also being very much aware of the challenge ahead of us, which is the upcoming presidency of the EU Council uh, starting on the 1st of July this year. So I don't know if that answers your question. Teraz mam pytanie do, do Anny. Przenosimy się ze Słowacji do, do Niemiec. Ponieważ tam to Anna, so we're moving from Slovakia to Germany. Because recently the public opinion in that country also focus on the results of elections. 
the national elections, I mean, to the land parliament. Well, the alternative for Germany, Germany had a very good result. A newly founded anti-immigrant populist rhetorical party. And until recently, uh, it wasn't quite an element in Germany, a country that doesn't have a populist party in its uh, system. So I'd like to ask you, what is the strategy of alternative for Germany? How does it gather the electorate? And do you think that alternative for Germany can go to um, the parliament. Um, yeah, quite a big uh, range of questions. But um, first of all, um, I, I would like to say that uh, nationalist and populist party are not really an issue with Germany. That's not the case. We have a history as well of uh, of right wing parties, usually um, not. <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, of course, uh, many years ago, but uh, I'm saying even, even more recently, uh, there has always been uh, an amount of people attracted to nationalist uh, parties. Um, we were always also lucky that usually the parties were not able to gather as much influence. Uh, that has to do with the fact that they, uh, maybe they separated, they split up, it was divided among different um, parties, but even in the 90s we already saw a rise in right-wing parties, and that kind of declined, uh, but it was a bit resolved as well from the party uh, itself, the Nationalist Party. Um, so it's not really a new phenomenon, and also we do have people, of course, who, who have a bit more right mindset, they might even not see it themselves, so that they feel quite comfortable in the established parties. But I think it's not something we cannot say. You know, we've been, we've passed this uh, period, and now we are completely uh, liberal, and we can't really say that either. Nevertheless, um, uh, the uh, alternative for Germany appeared on the stage uh, first of all uh, in the, in the times. Uh, whenever we saw the economic crisis in Europe, and it was kind of a one issue party which was anti Euro, uh, and it wanted Ger want Germany to leave the Euro. And um, of course, it's quite a limited uh, agenda, it was quite a limited agenda, and it, as you might know from yourself, when you get into when you got into the whole discussion about the Euro and the uh, rescuing Greece and all the technical details, people got pretty much lost and I think it wasn't such a hot topic other than saying we don't we want to give any money to Greece. Um, but you could already tell that the people in the party were trying to attract people who were more on the right side of the spectrum, not really as uh, ideological foundation but rather as to gather uh, electorate and uh, to increase um, uh, influence. Um, but in the end, it actually happened that the right wings, who were more anti-EU, anti-foreigners, actually took over from the more pra pragmatic anti-Euro uh, economists uh, and threw them out, or they left the party, and now they formed their own party, and that was a year ago. And it was before the real issue about uh, migration and uh, refugees and so on started. So at that time, I think everyone was hoping, okay, the, the party split in half. If we're lucky, we will see whatever happened to all the other right-wing parties that they kind of disappear. Um, and they were lucky, I guess, uh, that all the refugees started to come into Europe because it gave them a real agenda. What their agenda is, is basically whatever I can say for all right-wing populist parties and all other countries in Europe uh, is basically to say uh, to uh, address fears of the population against foreigners, um, to use these fears uh, against foreigners, um, to um, to increase them, to say that we are the ordinary folk and we are fighting against the established parties. 
Um, and that's very, very uh, similar um, to, uh, to the other countries. Uh, we do also see, I don't know, you might have heard uh, about Pegida as well, which is this kind of demonstration, uh, this demonstration group. And then they're spread, I think, it's across Germany, but also across other countries. And then they're not technically connected, but there are a lot of overlaps. So in the, in the end, it kind of this debate mixed a bit as well with the, the question of, uh, of this group. So it's a bit of a uh, dilemma uh, for the social democrats is that actually a lot of, uh, elect elect of the electorate um, that usually would maybe be attracted to social democratic arguments kind of now falls uh, for, for these more populist um, approaches. Uh, and that's more um, sort of working class um, people. And also what was quite, over the years we saw that um, support for the social democrats um, declined and also because people just stopped going to the elections at all. So they start to vote all together, and now we see that uh, the AFD is able to um, to get people back to the polls and to vote for them, and that's probably uh, voters that we lost some years ago. Um, so now we are also to do with the AFD. I think that has quite a lot of, uh, of has quite a lot to do with it. Um, that we are now, uh, as far as the polls are concerned, under 20 percent. It's a historic. Uh, historic uh, event. I guess it's that the first time we are under 20%, so everyone is really worried, but um, you can kind of tell the, the strategy. Before we had these right-wing parties, we had some regional, gov uh, regional parliaments where we already had uh, right-wing parties in the parliament, and the strategy was mostly just to ignore them. Of course, if they said certain things publicly, and it was quite, you know, denying the Holocaust happened, things like that. If that's something they said in public, of course, they, there were some measures taken, but you were, there was no cooperation with these parties. Um, they sort of did their own thing, and everyone cooperated, even the more democratic parties, they cooperated, but they tried to kind of ignore them. But uh, I think that with AFD, uh, you can tell they are not, you can't really ignore them anymore because they have gotten really, really Strong, uh, using all these fears and all these concerns that people have uh, because of the economic crisis. And uh, I would say that the Social Democrats haven't quite figured out actually how to deal with um, this issue. And you can tell this by looking at how each individual or individual politicians have addressed the issue. For instance, we had a regional ele or state elections, um, three, three state elections a couple of weeks ago and beforehand uh, we had a discussion because uh, our social democratic candidate she did not want to appear on TV with a uh, representative of the AFD and that sparked a whole debate about how do you actually deal with the AFD is it right discussion to just say you know you're illegi illegitimate we're not going to talk to you or to to talk to them and then show people that their arguments don't actually hold uh, true whenever you talk about certain things and uh, on the other hand we had our party leader Sigmar Gabriel uh, <coughs> well, it's not the AFD but uh, there was this concerns as well about how we deal with Pegida and people were saying the same thing you know you're very radical we are not talking to you uh, you have extreme views populist views but he went uh, and met some of the activists just to, to discuss with them or to, to listen to whatever their concerns were. And that was quite controversial as well. So it's not quite, I, I can't really see a real strategy yet, just because as well, we're faced with a bit of an identity crisis <laughs> about our own results. At the same time, I would say, we need to focus on our core, uh, core um, voters uh, the working class people and try to make more uh, initiatives that uh, strengthen our classic clientele uh, because that's where our voters and the AFD voters you know, sort of overlap uh, and I think uh, it's time that we um, take a bit more closer look at this. It's not always easy uh, sharing government uh, with uh, Angela Merkel uh, to make very progressive uh, moves. 
um, but uh, still I think we need a more clear strategy uh, how we deal with uh, the IFD because um, I do uh, I don't see why they wouldn't be in the next uh, part of it <coughs> unless something internal happened but I think from all the conditions now it's almost more realistic than here and we are not no, I'm, that's quite uh, quite strong but we are very close now in the polls and uh, so <coughs> quite a big problem for us I'm, but I'm quite certain that we'll be in the polls Dziękuję bardzo. I teraz chciałbym oddać głos now I'd like to uh, pass the microphone to Yusuf Pinor, asking him to provide a perspective that is not really on um, the state level, but more European vision. Uh, we were provided with the uh, image of what happens in each of the countries, but uh, similar visions could be provided by uh, people from Scandinavia or Austria or Western Europe. So in all those places where the populist radical right wing is growing strong and also uh, gain strongholds in the traditional electorates of the leftist uh, parties. And thus comes the question, the challenge. Uh, what should be the answer of the left wing of the Social Democrats to this challenge? Uh, we believe, uh, it seems that the left is on the defensive and along with liberal forces it is trying to defend a uh, status quo which is not really democratic, which uh, makes it lose trust uh, among the tr more traditional electorate. During the morning workshops today, uh, we mentioned a German politologist who was a guest at one of the conferences organized along with the Friedrich Herbert Foundation and the Fernando Lassau Foundation, Professor Merkel, who uh, said that there is a current danger that this division, this cleavage that uh, provided uh, the left-right division in politics is being substituted with a new division, a new cleavage. So the cosmopolitan uh, camp and the communist uh, camp, on the one side we have those who are the losers of uh, globalization, those who wish to close up the borders uh, and have security with closed borders, and the beneficiaries of the globalization who are uh, proponents of opening the, uh, the borders, universal human rights. And in this uh, division there is no room for a social democratic problem. Project. Yusuf, uh, do you see any opportunity for the left or a scenario which could uh, turn this trend around and bring the left-wing language and the left-wing values to the mainstream? Uh, this is a question that needs an answer that will take one and a half hour, but uh, to provide a short uh, answer, I'll try to uh, contribute my opinions to this discussion. First of all, I do not agree that social democracy has no place in this new division, as I would like to point out that what is uh, the essential meaning of social democracy? Historically, well, we are uh, talking uh, about Ferdinand Lassalle, who's our patron right now. Uh, the essence of social democracy is that more than 100 years ago there was this movement that uh, connected the economic struggle or the trade union struggle with the uh, political emancipation. This is the essence of social democracy. If we take one of these elements away, uh, this won't be social democracy anymore. Uh, if we have left-wing movements that are populist, who were fighting for economic issues, or perhaps other movements that are uh, strict, uh, strictly liberal, which fought only for the voting law, uh, what is historically essential for social democracy is that it combined the struggle for issues uh, related to social matters and uh, political emancipation. It's obvious that the landscape, the economic, social, and political landscape today is, is a new one, a different one. It's obvious that uh, we are experiencing a new global situation also in Europe. 
And this new global economic situation, this new political situation, uh, is also transforming the traditional uh, political cleavages. So the classical uh, division after the Second World War in Western Europe is somehow crumbling. And we're at a point in time when there, something new is emerging. From the point of view of political science, this is fascinating, but from the uh, point of view of politics, it's not really fascinating. I believe that the left in Europe is still a political force that is capable to fight for governments, for power, and for uh, the shape of the pol political arena in Europe. Right now we're looking uh, at Europe from the point of view of uh, Central Eastern Europe, but it's not everywhere in Europe that uh, the left is losing, okay? There are states and countries in which uh, social democracy is strong. One example is of the of North America, uh, which does not belong, does not fit into this uh, formula of classical social democracy. Uh, nevertheless, the left is able, capable of winning in North uh, America. So after uh, the creation of a coalition, uh, a pro-refugee coalition that is formed in uh, North America right now is unbelievable from the point of view of Europe. A pro-immigrant policy uh, was capable of winning the elections in the USA as part of the uh, coalition. So the, these are the results of Sanders in the uh, USA. They show that uh, it's not that the left is on the defense exclusively. <laughs> The specific situation in Europe is that, uh, and this is most interesting from our point of view, is that on the left from classical social democracy, there are new political movements and new political parties that are uh, able to emerge victorious from elections. Uh, this is uh, Demos, for example. In Poland, uh, the phenomena of the Razem party, which is uh, not in the parliament, but has uh, emerged on the polit political scene and has achieved 3% of support. And uh, even though quite often in social democratic circles this is uh, approached in uh, an ambiguous way as uh, these parties are quite often critical towards the classical social democratic parties, uh, nevertheless I see this as a certain hope, a hope for uh, more dynamics in, in the left, in Europe, a more dynamic situation. We have to be prepared uh, for the fact that uh, social democracy in Europe will be subject to change and that new uh, leftist forces will have an impact on the socialist politics. So this is a very new place uh, in the political arena that we are currently experiencing and we have to find uh, new solutions a completely new solution for the challenges ahead of us. But there is no doubt that this historical tradition, from my point of view, is absolutely, absolutely fundamental for us right now. Today, if the left will fail to spiritually and intellectually, politically uh, combine the social uh, issues with political emancipation, then we don't need a left. Uh, which will fail in this aspect. Perhaps this will be hard, but in the 19th century it was hard as well. Uh, as we know, at a certain point, La Salle himself uh, get, got in touch with uh, Bismarck as uh, it was uh, beneficial for Bismarck to provide uh, voting rights. And today this is also a very complicated. The situation is very complicated, but a hundred years ago it was also very complicated. We do remember uh, the struggles, the, these discussions uh, between LaSalle and Marx and Hesse, who the, the, the discussions that took place around the politics and the Prussian Empire, the new left uh, politics in that state. So right now we're at a point in time when there is a new division on the political arena 
There are new actors, political actors, new political movements. And I'm not really pessimistic. Uh, I don't think that it will be uh, only the right-wing movements will emerge victorious. There are new possibilities for what's going to happen on the left as well. Thank you very much. Now I would like to encourage you uh, to contribute to the discussion. We will gather all the questions and then uh, we'll give you an opportunity to the panelists uh, to give a short summary. First person. Hello. I would like to thank all the guests for what I've heard today. But also, I require a second debate. And in this second debate, I would like to hear about the mistakes made by uh, the ruling elites of Europe and United States in the last 20 years. First, we have to enumerate these mistakes and errors, then talk about the reasons behind them, and only afterwards get to work. That's one thing. The other thing. When Willy Brandt was the chancellor, uh, he opened a wondrous chapter of cooperation uh, with the Eastern Bloc states. This was essential for Polish. This is not a place to talk about this, but it was essential. Uh, when Reagan and Thatcher emerged, they've opened a new chapter, which we refer to the Washington Consensus. A lot of time has passed since then, and we, as a social democratic party, are not uh, experiencing any criticism. So, first of all, we have to do what I've mentioned. And, uh, in Poland, there's a very famous series about uh, Suleiman the Great, the Sultan. You may be laughing, but it's very popular in Poland. Uh, in one of the last scenes of the series, Suleiman is very, very sick, and he decides to cut the head of Pasha off. Uh, the Pasha who was responsible for Hungary, who was in charge of Hungary, and the Pasha asked, why are you trying to cut my head off? I was only punishing Christians. I even forced circumcision on Christian children. And the Sultan answered, you fool. Why did you divide my people? People who I rule over. Why did I bring this up? If we invite here, uh, immigrants to work when they were needed, we should treat them equally, both uh, their children and their grandchildren. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Łukasz Wyszewski. I'm a member of uh, Razem Party, Mr. Wiener, uh, Mr. Wiener, uh, Mr. Wiener, uh, Mr. Uh, we are so called New Left Week, and uh, I would like to ask you regarding what has happened in your countries. Uh, do you have any advice, social democrat to social democrat? What, we, what can we do to not let the worst come to, uh, came to the worst? So, what can we do as a so, uh, social democrats to not let uh, uh, Eastern European fascism rise? Thank you. My name is Radosław Czarnecki. I would like to share a, a general reflection with all of you. First of all, there are incomparable situations from Germany and the other countries. They are incomparable. Why? Why is right-wing populism victorious in these countries and not in other countries? First of all, in these countries, uh, the social ideology of chaos uh, failed, was a failure. I think this, this is obvious what I'm talking about. Naomi Klein mentioned this uh, in a book. We are in, here in Central Europe on a lower level, both technologically and not only technologically, than Germany. 
when compared to Germany. Secondly, we have to ask the question why in these four countries uh, quasi Nazis and quasi Nazis uh, have such strong social support. It's easy uh, to complain that they win and gather uh, votes, but we have to answer why. Aristotle himself said that we won't uh, know the truth without finding out the reason. So this is where we should begin. Uh, Senator Pinheiro is uh, optimistic. Well, I'm pessimistic since uh, it says that uh, it seems that pessimists are those optimists who uh, have seen the truth. But this is a digression. A right wing wind is right now all over Europe. Uh, in Greece, uh, Romania, uh, Romania, Latvia as well, Denmark, the true Swedes, the true Finns in these countries, Great Britain, the winter in uh, Belgium. Why? This is the question. I cannot find an easy answer to this question. Marie Le Pen is also a classical example. If we can't answer this, it's possible that we will wake up in 1939 once again. Thank you very much, Victor Kato from the Prato University. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a couple of questions that you mentioned. But that also concerning us, the listeners, who care about the left as well as the future of the left. In my opinion, I've got a couple of issues here. First of all, the issue of the white front, left front. Social democracy itself, in my opinion, cannot effectively oppose to the huge capital power that is growing in, in power. We have globalization, the concentration of capital in the hands of a few people. The authors mention a lot of comparisons, saying that this small amount of people can all sit in one wagon of the train. And in their hands, half of the global wealth is there. So this is the threat. The capital strength is still huge because they have a country in their hands. And not only we can feel or we can threaten the left with a lot of fascist parties that are not coming, are not emerging out of themselves, but they are, let's say, created on an order of the society. And secondly, we have another issue, another threat. I mean, the peril of a war. Because this war and is installed as this mechanism of maintaining the power by huge capital. In those times, when we cannot control the situation enough by democracy, and currently this is the huge risk that we are facing. Not only crypto fascism is threatening the world, but the real fascism. It doesn't mean that this fashion will emerge in the form of SS officers or other known from history. This could be fascism directed by an elegant man in the front of a political party that uses democratic democratic mechanisms. So I see this huge danger in front of us. And in our discussion today, and also more widely in the European Union category, we need to pose the threat of the new unity all the people that are not happy with the current capitalism. So this unity, this platform needs to be very wide, but it guarantees that in the long-term perspective, this right can be stopped. Obviously, there are numerous other problems, but I think other need to mention their comments as well. 
Anyone interested in <coughs> posing a question? Well, leaving the social issues, obviously it's fundamental reason for the right parties that are referring to the social issues are winning the elections. Just to be clear, please remember that before peace, the Polish uh, right party, uh, the civic platform was ruling, and Ms. Petra said a very interesting thing about historical politics. Petra Saga, thank you. So she was speaking about the lack of the concept, how to realize this historical policy, what caused taking over the narration of the right left policy. Also, the Hungary was the same situation. So this issue is not really included in the narration of the 56. In Poland, we do not have this PPS legend, and our peace party in Poland refer to it. So instead of the, the, our right-left party just didn't mention the, the human rights or the working class fight. So is there any idea to connect to this historical narration, to bring it back? Because we can laugh at the soldiers but it doesn't change the fact that it's quite attractive for the young person because they can refer to those heroes so this young person can fight for huge values and ideas so we see that the era of post politics is ended we need to close it and we need to mention right now very openly that now right now we are coming back to the huge values the question is how to define them, how to bring them back. Thank you very much. Do we have any other questions? So, shall we start with the same order that we... Zoltan, can you refer to these questions? The first of the mistakes of the of the elites after the transition, the transition elites in, in the Central European government. Of course, that is true. And uh, for the Hungary, the Orban government, and uh, and uh, and uh, and the presence of. Uh, Strong extremist party will be is a consequence of something, but of course, that is why I don't think it could be a topic of another discussion. It's a very long story, and the social dissatisfaction uh, was an, an important uh, factor of, uh, of the Indian election uh, uh, by Orban in 2010. It uh, followed the uh, deal for. Uh, with packages, of course, and, uh, and, uh, and Fidesz and, uh, and also Yopi uh, has the ambition to, uh, <coughs> to uh, represent themselves as the parties of, uh, of social protection, which was the, which was the, uh, uh, so this issue was dominated by the Socialist Party for 20 years and the socialists uh, uh, lost their credibility uh, in this field. And uh, in Hungary, there are also uh, new leftist movements, groups, uh, small parties, uh, uh, intellectual groups, of course, but uh, and it is a, so, uh, I don't know what it is, to visit them, I don't know what, uh, uh, for them, uh, uh, Sources, financing sources are uh, are uh, 
crucial weaknesses uh, uh, of, of these parties and uh, uh, the example of Venus and lobbying. Uh, also, also prove that uh, uh, building institutions uh, is a very, is a core, core question for 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 these parties. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, and uh, and that is why this credibility question is also uh, very important for for uh, the. Uh, Social Democratic parties, also, and, and yes, I, uh, I I I agree that uh, in the background we can find uh, lack of uh, reflection, uh, reflection uh, to the globalization for the inequalities in the societies uh, in the terms of, of creating a vision, and uh, this is another long story that uh, how how social democrats uh, mixed their uh, uh, politics with neoliberal elements, uh, but on the other hand, from a liberal point of view, uh, so another Andean example, uh, socialists are not just neoliberals, this is the leftist uh, criticism on, on the socialists, but from a liberal point of view, they are uh, uh, the distributor parties, money scattering uh, uh, party also, uh, I think this is the dark side of pragmatism, and uh, that means that uh, that they have a very confused uh, politics and and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a clearer ideological profile uh, would be uh, would be an important uh, part of of, of, a, of a left uh, 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 renewal. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I'm an activist, so these words will be kind of harsh. Okay. Uh, why does social democratic Eli fail? I know why. Uh, because. Uh, they play another man's game, and that's also answered to your question. We can't afford to play another man's game. If we are talking about migration, we can't play this game. We can't reframe the question. Uh, and the question should be posed, what can we do for people? Because I think social democratic allies are not in touch with people, and therefore uh, there's a floor for Podemos, uh, Syriza, etc., which I partly identify with, even though I'm a social democrat, and um, because they answer uh, the questions in the social economy way. Come on, whose fault is Panama Papers? I think it's social democratic fault. Why? Because we can uh, create a global approach to this problem, to this tax avoidance. Come on, and this is the main problem. The, uh, the money coming offshore and immigrants coming inshore. Uh, you know, come on, that's paradox, isn't it? Uh, we, we, uh, we need a solidarity with refugees, and we don't need solidarity from the billionaires that are paying taxes in some Bahamas, etc. So this is the main problem, and that's why we are not so credible. And this Razan, etc., could be credible. Uh, so I think uh, with the new generation of social democrats, there is a possibility that we can, uh, we can uh, win in this clash. But if there are still the same faces around 25 years, as I, as I have told you about Noah Dema, who is one of the faces, we can't win. We can't win. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, at least the first three or four of your questions have a common denominator. That is, what do we do wrong? We should be honest to ourselves. Let's be critical to, critical to ourselves. What can we do to prevent success and rise, uh, the rise of right extremism? And um, yeah. 
So I agree with you. The problem is that the octopus of oligarchy is strangling social democracy. And uh, we can very nicely talk about the political class having less powers at the cost of the economic class, of the power of the financial markets. But if we are to be honest, we have to say that social democracy as well is in the service of oligarchy. And a lot of, it, a lot of its policies are um, defending the interests of oligarchs. So that's my question, what can we do better? This is connected as well to the right of right extremism that the people don't feel represented. So they look for alternatives where they feel represented. Simple as that. Um, left wing politics have always been and should be about criticism of capitalism. This is what I'm missing in the discussion, Europe-wide. And um, is there the lady that asked me the question about the remembrance culture? Um, I'm not sure I understood the education. The education. How, how we should bring back the narrative. Well, I, I think the most effective means of bringing back the narrative, but it is not a, a fast solution, is to work on history education at schools. A history education um, that bases on interpretations of history that uh, come from international dialogue, to say, to say the least. Um, I think Germany is a good example um, of, of how education, history education can be made. And I think it's probably the best one in Europe uh, of how we can come to terms with uh, the past. At the same time, it has to be said, it is perhaps uh, arriving at the edge of uh, variability for the people from what I, I mean, I've lived in Germany, I've studied in Germany. So um, I've heard a lot of critical voices of people you know, having this topic always brought up at school and um, on the TV and so on and so on. Um, but I don't think that this is the major factor that can prevent the rise of right extremism. Because if it were the case, then we would have no right extremism in Germany. And Germany has had such a successful policy, and we still have Pegida. So I think this is a soft policy tool that should be used, that should be considered, should be discussed, especially in the light of recent developments. But I would not hope it can solve everything. But certainly narratives have the place in uh, formulating visions about society. Does that answer your question? Uh, maybe to come to that point uh, for a second, because um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a quite interesting uh, question. And you were kind of saying, how do we make a decision to maybe integrate these issues into the curricula of the schools and so on? And I mean, in Germany, it wasn't that easy that someone said, well, maybe we should just, you know, discuss this in school, but it was a whole political movement and there was a big uh, upheaval in the 1960s uh, and there was a sort of questioning of the parent generation and there were all the parents, uh, Nazi period and that so led to this whole reform of uh, the school system and so on. And uh, to some extent, uh, from, from my point of view, the countries, I mean the transformation is still quite recent if you look at uh, overall history uh, and it might be comparable but this is now a time you know you've, you've, you've come the, kind of a, you, you, it's been a few years now since uh, transformation happened and I'm not quite sure if we could see similar movements like we saw in the 1960s uh, in Germany but all across um, across the, uh, the globe which um, poses questions about the, the, the old history and the time, what happened, what kind of questions do we need? And for me as an outsider, that's something that I'm sometimes wondering. So it needs to come off from the society as well and to demand, uh, uh, demand more information about that time. Maybe that was just my uh, idea about it. What? Yes, I mean, so I don't think 
I apologize, I just want to intervene at this place. I don't think it will come from society on its own because when, in the times of crisis, when people are faced with existential problems of survival, this is not a topic, the only topic. Oh, I can see that. Uh, I was, it's more a theoretical idea. I know that at the moment there's a sort of luxury problem uh, to have. Um, I was going to say that uh, obviously the um, uh, social democrats need to deliver more on their core demands. Um, something we've seen in Germany, which is actually quite paradox, is um, we have learned, we have been in coalition with, um, uh, the con with Angela Merkel's party uh, previously, and we've been very bad in putting through our agenda and defending uh, the agents that we wanted to perceive. Uh, in the government and we learned from this and we're, we got much better in, in putting our demands forward and in our uh, common coalition contract we were able uh, to install quite a lot of demands that we have and especially when we started off uh, in the government we were very uh, successful uh, to introduce minimum wage for example which was a stigma and the Christian Democrats for years said over my dead body do we get minimum wage and that's one of the keystones of this government. However, uh, weirdly enough, the social democrats did not profit from this at all. Uh, instead it was Angela Merkel, people were saying, oh Angela Merkel's got so social, we really like it. And she really got support probably from a lot of uh, base uh, from social democratic um, electorate. So in a way, we were not really able to uh, to make these gains uh, um, work for us in the end. Um, but I think what I find quite uh, interest, uh, important is, you know, I wasn't quite sure if the gentleman in the back was saying the right wing populism is something that's quite different in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Uh, I was a bit, I didn't quite. Uh, understood what you say. To my mind, I think, of course, the reasons for specific movements are quite different in a way, but I think the problem uh, is very similar, uh, is that you uh, have a certain, certain arguments, you put forward certain arguments, uh, you have a xenophobic agenda, you're trying to use stereotypes to create uh, fear in, the, uh, in the society, and most, most um, for us, maybe as established party, quite critically, is, a pop, is all across Europe. It's movements who say that the people who are in power, who've been in power for years, or the political establishment, do not act in favour uh, of the population. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, that is common uh, across Europe, and that's something that the political establishment uh, needs to consider. Uh, what I think is quite important uh, when we look. That was something that you were saying um, when we look at globalization and how many um, tools we even we actually have in the nation states to address uh, challenges that globalization poses. It's very very limited, uh, of course. So what is quite crucial is um, that we need to cooperate more on the European level, which is something that we are now. You know that's why we come as well to discuss with you, to discuss among us. Um, what solutions could be, but uh, we're not just sitting at home discussing among ourselves, but we need to uh, discuss among each other. And um, many of the issues, uh, we were talking about the Panama Papers, about tax evasion, that's nothing that's what even Europe can probably not solve this question because Panama won't really care much uh, about what we're going to do in this respect. Uh, but still, uh, we need uh, to widen our influence and cooperate now on the European level in these respects. Um, yes, so at the same time, uh, the lady has uh, left the room, unfortunately, uh, who's saying we need to look back and see what all the mistakes we, um, we made in the last 20 years. Um, I, I, I do support that in a way, at the same time I can understand that now uh, with the with uh, social democrats, democratic parties uh, across Europe, with uh, the question of how to deal with refugees at a very different time, um, to look back and to analyze and discuss, even though I'm, I'm really in favor of doing that. Uh, but um, you can tell that, that uh, the political actors are under pressure uh, to find answers right now, which is also the, the struggle maybe. And uh, I do think we should take some time to look back 
But I think for for now, we need to look ahead and find solutions for the problems we have at the moment. Um, and uh, even then, once we've solved all these questions, um, we should also look back. W dużym skrócie, ja, ja myślę, to co I'll be short. I think that what uh, Mrs. Kaczorowska mentioned is, uh, well, post-politics are over, especially in, in Poland. Right now we are, uh, <coughs> we are the victims of a, of a very strong policy, postmodernist uh, policy after 1989. I think that in Hungary it was a uh, similar the situation was similar. And this is over. Right now we are at a new level of uh, history, both in Europe and all over the world. It's not that I'm optimistic. Uh, that's, it's not that simple. I do believe that this situation is very dynamic, not only uh, from the point of view of uh, the threats and uh, victories uh, by the right, but also from the point of view of what's happening on the left. These new left-wing movements or new parties, leftist parties, uh, which showed up especially in and South Europe, but also in Poland, we have the phenomenon of the Razen Party. Will this uh, will this uh, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen if it's going to uh, if these parties will somehow have to uh, struggle with. Social democratic, social democracy. Uh, for example, uh, at the regional level, the situation is completely different. So, will these parties uh, change social democracy from a historical point of view? So, bring some new life into social democracy? Uh, it's hard to tell. Uh, in the last 150 years, that was the case. The radical parties, which began from attacking social democracy uh, and left social democracy, returned to social democratic ideas. So, whether there will be some sort of synergy uh, or just a crash, it's very hard to predict. We're basically incapable of predicting it. So it's not that I'm just uh, optimistic. The situation is d dynamic, just like in Polish. With uh, all what's happening right now in Poland, the catastrophe of uh, the left not being in Parliament, since we are right now talking in a country which, apart from Ireland, uh, which is the only second country in the European Union where the left is uh, outside of the Parliament, uh, taking all this catastrophe into account and that the ma parliamentary majority is right now uh, pursuing nationalist policy, national politics, it's still a success that there is a new party, the Razen Party, which gained 3%. This is a very interesting phenomenon, a positive phenomenon. A positive phenomenon. So it's uh, what I mean is we should not follow the uh, a very depressive mentality that uh, we've lost everything, uh, all we have left is history, and uh, there is no future. That's not the case. I'm sure that it's uh, not the case. It's obvious that the answer on the left has to be a European answer. What I've said uh, was uh, happened in the beginning, what was the characteristic trait of the left, which is combining the social issues with uh, political emancipation, with uh, human rights and political rights. There is also a third element that I wish to add now, and that's internationalism. Uh, not in the sense of uh, the left being uh, anti-national, because uh, uh, it is formed within a, uh, a state, but it can extend its influence onto the international level. So there is something wrong 
taking place right now with social democracy uh, since we're not capable uh, of uh, meeting really of cooperating with uh, Eastern Europe what Kaczynski did with Orban in Poland for uh, for, for a guest from uh, outside of Poland there was a, a meeting between Kaczynski and Orban this just showed that they are true politicians uh, that they are capable of discussing certain aspects and no such things happen on the left it is not apparent as it should be the, the, these attempts at cooperation so our answer should only be uh, European answer organized at the level of the European Parliament or the international or uh, European institutions but allow me to repeat that uh, we should not follow this uh, depressive mentality, political mentality, which is quite easy to do in Poland right now. It's not that we've lost everything, that the cause is lost. I do believe that we do so uh, have some energy and some sources uh, that we can use for political offensive. We have some resources. Um, and to sum up, the issue mentioned by uh, the lady here is crucial. Historical education, teaching history in uh, Eastern Central Europe, especially in Poland and especially in Hungary, uh, we did uh, simply give away history to the right wing. In Poland, it is the right wing that is colonizing Polish history right now. Uh, I mostly mean schools. Uh, in Poland, the situation is that for 25 years, it is the right wing that is colonizing history. Uh, using the tools that we have provided it with, which was a big mistake, probably. The decision to allow uh, religion being taught in schools, but it did happen. And the left uh, right now has to prepare an answer for this, using a, a sort of jargon with its own narration. If the right wing is able to show its heroes all the time, to present its historical idols, and the left uh, is not really doing it, what you meant about Tuzak, for example, uh, I have my own contribution to the Razen uh, party. Uh, it is a new party, but I, I do not see uh, in the Razen party to have, uh, for you to have uh, some sort of historical policy to show the roots of your heroes, uh, to introduce your own narration in this, uh, in this uh, understanding. I believe that uh, it is a very important issue, the issue of political history and uh, an issue which we could call uh, cultural hegemony. So the paradox in this Central Eastern Europe is that Gramsci was read uh, by the right and not the left. And Gramsci wrote that in order to gain political power, you first have to conquer cultural hegemony. And it's apparent in Poland. And it is apparent that uh, there have been some uh, bad moves on the left. And that is why it remains outside of Parliament. Uh, secondly, the differences between Western Europe and Central Eastern Europe. As the LaSalle Center, we quite often participate in discussions by social democrats from all over Europe. And we always had to do with certain problems to translate the specifics of the party systems or the political culture in countries which we, which are so-called post-communist, and the Western European countries, uh, developed countries of parliamentary democracy. I believe that, especially in, in the last years, when it comes to radically populist right-wing movements, uh, one might say that these orders are uh, becoming similar. Uh, a number of years ago, I prepared an article about comparing the populist radical right-wing uh, attitudes to uh, right-wing attitudes in Western Europe, and there were apparent uh, differences. In Europe, they were uh, neoliberal, and they were not really referring uh, directly to neo-fascist roots, whereas in Central Eastern uh, countries, these parties were often openly racist but also very socialist in their rhetoric rhetoric and right now i think this is changing 
uh, the populist right-wing parties uh, in Western Europe are moving in onto the social field, which is seen in the National Front in France, which is a great example. And on the other hand, the radical right-wing in Eastern Europe uh, clearly attempts at transforming its image to uh, an image of a party who is capable of uh, co-governance. I think that these differences are slowly fading, uh, so I believe that we definitely need cooperation between social democracy on the European level. And also the issue, finally, uh, related to the new left-wing movements, uh, even more to the left from social democracy. How can we classify this? Syriza or Podemos uh, created their own position using the conflict with the traditional social democratic parties, uh, but there are also examples of other states where leftist parties on the left from the social democracy also create coalition governments with other parties, with social democratic parties, for example, Norway and the eight year reign of the socialist parties and the labor party in uh, Norway, but also Iceland with Democrats and ra the radical left, and perhaps Portugal, the current government in Portugal, which is uh, a phenomena, European phenomena, because in this government, government there is a, a socialist party, members of the socialist party, uh, the left wing bloc, which is uh, a Portuguese uh, equivalent of Syriza. These parties are, have very similar roots. And the Communist Party of Portugal, which is uh, far more orthodox and is a traditional Communist Party, which uh, did not abandon its traditions, uh, referring, for example, Lenin and his, uh, his policy. So I believe that these new movements, these new leftist movements, uh, are hard to define. And I define them that, uh, as parties which are radically left-wing, as they follow the old traditional social democracy. Thus, I believe that especially in the 90s, social democratic parties moved uh, towards the center, accepting the logic of neoliberalism and also in this way creating uh, some room for these radical left-wing parties, which along with the neoliberalization of social democracy, uh, accepted social democratic features themselves. So in an age of this uh, neoliberal hegemony, the radical person is that uh, who resembles the old or pursues the old social democratic traditions. So to sum up, I would like to uh, bring up uh, an occurrence from 2013, an event along with uh, the Friedrich Hebert Foundation uh, after the 150th anniversary of the German uh, social democracy, which is one of the most important for uh, organization for social democracy in general. We invited Zygmunt Baumann, who, uh, in his very interesting speech, uh, which is available uh, as it is written down in many languages uh, in the internet, he pointed out that social democracy in the 90s resigned from creating an alternative to market solutions. So the slogan of European Social Democrats was that we will do the same things that the right wing will do, but we will do it better. So they uh, abandoned a certain ambition of creating a new project. I believe that uh, the traditional social democratic parties have to pay the price for it now. And now, uh, the second issue related to the tools uh, used by social democrats create something that they can be proud of, that is a uh, welfare state, a Western European welfare state in the first uh, three decades after the World War. Uh, uh, state institutions uh, of the welfare state were crucial in that process. And today, in an age of globalization, this is still very important, as uh, the crisis, the economic crisis itself showed that the state has available tools uh, to provide an economic policy, but uh, in a struggle with uh, a transnational capital, uh, it is uh, it is very hard, it is helpless uh, in creating a transnational uh, transnational institution which could be uh, something that a social democracy could use as an effective tool to create a more uh, 
a more just uh, society. So I believe that we as the creators of these sort of meetings uh, hold these uh, these issues are very important for us. So we're very grateful that we were able to invite people from, from Germany, so Slovakia, uh, Hungary and the Czech Republic. Uh, thank you for being here. And the last words belong to Zygmunt Bauman, who similarly to Isa Pinar said that right now we are under very completely new circumstances in a very new situation and we do not know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, the situation of left-wing people right now is similar to, to those left-wing proponents from 150 years ago. So I'm a, large, I'm a huge optimist and I do believe that we have a better starting point as we do have certain institutions and a certain heritage that uh, European institutions still remember, so our starting point is not that bad, and creating something new in itself is a fascinating process. So I would like to encourage you to participate in this uh, these debates. I encourage you to uh, participate in new uh, events organized by the the Friedrich Heber Foundation and the LaSalle Foundation. So once again, thank you for deciding to uh, dedicate your uh, afternoon to meet with us. Thank you very much.